Well, it's an odd book, <clears throat> arabesque. It's a sort of potpourri of reminiscences and conversations and reveries, my usual sort of jumble, clustered around a man, André Gide, half-forgotten figure now, although by the look of you, some of you will have, in fact, read him, perhaps 40 years ago, when he was popular. But these half-forgotten figures are the ones I like best. And it's a man that I've long felt I have something in common with, a lot really, everything from our severely Protestant younger years to our particular way of travelling. He, of course, was a Nobel Prize winner, had two castles in Normandy and knew Oscar Wilde, and I'm not, don't, and didn't. <laughs> but in most respects, not all. I do underline, not all. I felt close enough to him to want to know him better. Well, Ogden Nash put his clever finger on the nub of the matter in this couplet that I quote as an epigraph. Home is heaven and orgies are vile. But you need an orgy once in a while. <laughs> home, you see, and not home. That's what the book's about. Being away and coming home to who you are again. The book actually opens in Algiers. <clears throat> but I'm going to read first a passage about the genesis of, of the book. Mm, it's sort of paraphrased a bit, but this is something that really happened. One cold Sunday afternoon, a year or two ago, on a back road in Normandy, Zaida, the Berber princess, stopped her car so that the three of us could stretch our legs. Can you hear me all right at the back? Yes? We'd been singing old cold, cold porter songs to cheer ourselves up after lunch in a depressingly jolly restaurant by the sea. We'd tried Charles Trenet, but Miriam, the Sri Lankan artist from Melbourne, had wanted something a touch saucier. So we'd launched into always true to you in my fashion, and just kept going. The restaurant had been full of large Norman families smelling of cider, tucking into bowls of steaming mussels in rich sauces at large round tables. No couples, no solitary diners with hungry eyes, just families. There are few things more depressing than gatherings of other people's families. Families, I hate you as the Oscar Wilde character in Cheat's Fruits of the Earth famously exclaims, your enclosed hearths, your tightly shut doors, your jealously guarded happiness. In that youthful work, Gide still thought in his giddy way that he could escape them. To tell the truth, not just this restaurant, but the whole of Normandy struck me as rather grim. Beautiful, yes, in a green, sodden sort of way, but closed off, as if peopled entirely by sanctimonious widows priests and secret poisoners. Admittedly, the spot where we chose to stretch our legs seemed almost enchanted. It was in a shallow, wooded valley in the Calvados region, with a meadow of buttercups sloping down towards a nearby stream. The hum of insects in the air, the quiet chirping of hidden birds, somehow made the cool, greenish silence even thicker. An abandoned farmhouse just above us on the hillside seemed to be staring at us with suspicion. Nothing moved. Then the princess, in jeans, she's an utterly modern princess, noticed a small black caterpillar inching its way across the road in front of our car. If we'd stopped a second later, we'd have squashed it. We crouched to admire it. Shuffle, shuffle, so tiny, so tender. It was headed for a gateway we'd hardly noticed on the other side of the road. The gateway itself was overhung with huge old trees, home oaks perhaps, and half obscured by vines. On one wall was a small plaque. To Ok Be. I went over and pushed back the tangle of leaves to read it. It was the Chateau de la Roque Beignard. I was thunderstruck. Gide, I said, La Roque Beignard. Who? Gide, André Gide. He lived here as a child. This is his castle. This is where he spent his summers and started writing. writing. Even after he married, and my mind flew backwards, trying to gather up all the tiny, brightly coloured shards that Gide had scattered about in his books. Books I barely remembered. Then just a jumble in my memory. And he loved caterpillars, I added. Then it's a sign, 
said Zaida, the Berber princess, gravely. De Bonagur, ça c'est sûr, said Miriam, whose French is never less than elegant. A sign, yes, but of what? Apart from anything else, I don't believe in signs. Who sends them? Before setting off again, we looked for the caterpillar, but it had gone. Trying to recollect André Gide as we drove towards Paris was like scraping the dust and sand of decades off a mosaic floor to uncover a half-forgotten face, barely remembered limbs. Some of the pieces seemed to have broken or to have disappeared, but bit by bit, a familiar image began to appear. Gladiators and gazelles, as it were, and rose bushes, cupids, cowherds, a naked youth playing a lyre, the usual things you find in a mosaic. Every image needing some background to make it look real. The longer I talked, and we must have been halfway to Paris by the time I felt silent, the more strongly I felt that I was renewing a valued friendship I'd unaccountably let slip. More than that, I was restoring a lost intimacy. It was foolish of me, really, to give in to this surge of sentimentality in the gathering dark. Intimacy was out of the question. It was like loving Jesus. It was absurd, but still, that's what it felt like. The thing is, Miriam said, finally, lilting very fetchingly, you make him sound a bit like you. No, not at all, I said. I, I don't mean to compare myself with André Gide at all. I'm not talking about comparing, she said, looking straight ahead at Paris, glowing like Gomorrah on fire in the distance. I'm talking about things shared. At this, she glanced over her shoulder at me from the front seat. You really must try to remember more of what he meant to you. And it sounds to me as if remembering him will be almost the same as remembering yourself. Well, what I think, said Zaida, who is a compulsive traveller, is that you should go to Algiers, go to the Casbah, go to, where was it, Blida, Biskra, go to Tunisia, the Congo. Well, I don't know about Congo, I said. The Congo sounds a bit radical. But Uzes is not out of the question. Some of you will know Uzes uh, in the south of France, near Nîmes. A little bit of perfection. They both agreed that Uzes was a gem. The south, Languedoc, the sun, the rockiness, the scrubby hills to the west of Nîmes, balm to the soul. It was almost Africa, so unlike Normandy, with goat herds. Everywhere you look, I should think, said Miriam. And if you go to Algiers, Zaida added, you must meet Yacouba. I do go to Algiers, and I do meet Yacouba. Well, Gide started travelling in his early 20s, as I did. Both of us in search, I think, in much the same places, of kaleidoscopic moments, moments when we're reconfigured, if you know what I mean, when we bring our double out of the shadows into the light. Travel is what this book is partly about, although it's not a travel book. But it's about how... I like to travel, Hajid like to travel in France, Italy and elsewhere, but particularly in North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, because that is where nothing we see or encounter reminds us of who we are at home. Well, here I am in Sousse, in Tunisia, a seaside town popular with Finns and Germans on package tours. I went there because it's where young André first turned round and looked who he was in the eye. In the rue El Cahid that morning, absolutely nothing was happening. From time to time, a pink English couple in shorts and sun hats would traipse past towards the covered markets at the bottom of the hill, obliging the bored young souvenir sellers lounging outside their stalls to make a half-hearted attempt to interest them in a brass plate or stuffed camel. But nobody was buying. Madame, Monsieur, come inside, venez entrer, comme en sie rein. I have many beautiful plates, and made in sauce, sehr schön. 
but with a wave of a pink hand they would plod past, stunned by the heat, although it was only late March. At one point, a clutch of elderly Germans picked its way up the stepped street. You could hear the ripple of coaxing calls following them uphill. But they too swatted the young men aside and kept grimly climbing. On the way to the Kasbah, probably, the old citadel on the edge of the Medina, just above us, a museum now, full of fabulous Roman mosaics. It's the only thing worth seeing in Sus, at least from an elderly German point of view. The only real Sehnswürdigkeit. Auf Wiedersehen, the boy opposite me called after them in a trailing voice. He wouldn't be seeing them again, though. Anne knew it and didn't care. He leant back against the whitewashed wall in the shade and flashed me a grin. Sava? He didn't care about that either. But polite banter was his job. As it happened, things couldn't have been better. After the noisy chaos of Tunis, this tranquil corner of Sus was bliss. For a start, I love places where there's nothing much to see in the way of Sehnswürdigkeiten. There's no real English equivalent. Things sightseers should see. Sehnswürdigkeiten, cathedrals, palaces, national museums, monuments, anything remotely military, make me tense. I just spent an arduous day up in Carthage, trudging around the ruins, yapped up by guides and fried in the sun. Punic houses, Roman villas, a museum, an amphitheater, baths, basilicas, and acropolis. And that was only scratching the surface. In Susa, there's nothing at all you have to see. Once you've admired the Roman mosaics in the Caspar, you're free. Now you can start looking. However, as Gide once said, to free yourself is nothing. It's being free that's hard. It's when I'm freest that I feel the furthest from happiness, he once wrote ruefully in one of his purposeful Protestant moods. Nietzsche also thought that being free was difficult, but usefully so. It sorted the sheep from the goats. The man who has become free, he wrote, spurns the contemptible sort of well-being dreamt of by shopkeepers, Christians, cows, women, Englishmen and other Democrats. The free man is a warrior. Not many warriors in the Rue Souk El Kaid that morning. More to the point, the passers by seemed without exception to be shopkeepers, Christians, women, Englishmen, and other Democrats. No cows. Mostly at a complete loss to know what to do with their freedom, but vaguely aware that they should be doing something. By the look on their faces, most of those plodding past me were still doing what Gide would call rowing or at least going through the motions. On the very eve of sailing for North Africa, he wrote in his diary that he was like a sailor who drops his oars and abandons himself to the currents. At last he takes the time to look at the shores. As long as he was rowing, he didn't look. Or what Jid saw when he stopped rowing and started looking in Sus was Ali. And this led to a revelatory experience in the Sandhills which are no longer there, of course. It's high-rise hotels as far as the eye can see these days. Exactly what happened with Ali in the Sandhills is not clear from the truncated English language edition of If It Die, Gide's autobiography, which I first read in a bookshop. Angus and Robertson's actually in Castle Ray Street, if you're from Sydney, when I was working there at the age of 14. But don't worry, I have my sources and I tell you, but not tonight. Now, the interesting thing about this experience is not the rather banal shenanigans, but that, having had it, he could now contemplate marriage. It's true that he had some misgivings. Before becoming engaged, I write, he decided to consult a doctor just to reassure himself that his desires and marriage were perfectly compatible. The doctor, after listening to the young man's confession, offered him this startling piece of advice. You're saying that while you love a young woman, you're hesitating to marry her, being aware at the same time of your tastes. Get married. Marry without fear. And you'll quickly realize that everything else exists only in your imagination. You give me the impression of a starving man 
who has been seeking to quench his hunger on pickled gherkins. <laughs> Once you're married, you'll soon understand what the natural instinct is and come back to it spontaneously. Well, it was 1895. He did marry his cousin Madeleine, a young woman of terrifying piety, a Protestant like himself, whom he loved utterly and stayed married to until she died, some four decades later, 43 years later. But it was not the sort of marriage celebrated in Hello! magazine or on Home and Away. <laughs> Sexually, it was pickled gherkins all the way for Gilles. <laughs> but I'm interested in marriage, and like Gilles, was once married. Or perhaps I'm less interested in marriage than in coupledom. This was a very singular union. Gide was a very singular man. It was an intensely loving union, probably ill-advised, but chaste. Mariage blanc, as the French say, rather delicately. Well, after a few days in Sousse, probably on about the third day, which is usually critical in my experience, I started to feel thin, if you know what I mean. Was I travelled to feel thickened? In fact, I lived to feel thickened, having arrived very thin. Sousse is a beach resort town of no particular distinction, although popular with Ukrainians. Earlier that same morning, I'd found myself having breakfast at my hotel with a large family of Baptists from Tennessee. Once the prayers and blood-curdling Bible readings were over, Psalm 59, O Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen, be not merciful to any wicked transgressors, consume them in wrath, consume them that they may not be, and worse. They'd exchanged a bit of chit-chat about what they would be praying for that day, for the sweetness of Jesus to come into the hearts of those they met and so forth. Then the part of Familius reaching for the fig jam turned to me and asked, And what is your prayer for today, my friend? Ah, well, I said, I'm going to Kairouan. Kairouan, he froze, knife immobilized in the jam. The whole table froze. Kairouan, he said, softly. Looking me straight in the eye is the heart of evil. Well, this was thrilling news. <laughs> I knew hardly anything about Karawan, really. I did know that while passing through it on his first trip to Africa, just over a year before the incident in the Casbah, with which I begin this book, Gide and his companion, Paul Laurent, were invited to a feast of 32 courses by the caliph. But I had no idea why. I also knew that the mosque of Sidi Okba in Karwan, some of you will know it, is the fourth most important destination for pilgrims after Mecca, Medina and Jerusalem. It had probably been there that he'd witnessed believers dancing in a state of mystic madness to the music of Negro drummers, beating on their tom-toms and long drums under a downpour of clacking castanets. Seven visits to the mosque of Sidi Okba you might like to remember this, are worth one to Mecca. Unfamiliar as I am with all the intricacies of divine bookkeeping, I presume, however, that no merit at all accrued to either Andre or me for visiting it. We'll pray for you, the Baptist said. The whole family, grandma, sons, daughters-in-law, grandchildren, nodded. I'd rather you didn't, I said. <laughs> it's not something I feel comfortable with. I can't stand this sort of spiritual meddling. Nobody has the right to ask for favours on my behalf without my leave. I was on the point of adding that I had a bright blue hand of Fatima up in my room, which I was sure would ward off evil just as effectively as the unasked for prayers of Baptists from Tennessee. But I thought better of it. Aren't you a Christian? The knife was stuck in the fig jam. From your point of view, I said, Choosing my words carefully and knowing I sounded pompous, probably not. 
A distinct chill descended on the gathering, so as soon as I could get to the fig jam, I ate up quickly and set off for the bus to Kairouan. The train, unfortunately, no longer runs. Well, there was no train to Jem either, another nearby town I visited, famous for its Roman Colosseum, one of the largest and best preserved in the world. It looms above the ugly jumble of Jem like a sinister mirage. When I first caught sight of it, unexpectedly, turning a corner near the bus station, I just stood there staring at it, stunned. It could hardly be real. It was so out of scale, so astonishingly intact and quite deserted. Grace and power, as well as slaughter on a grand, almost voluptuous scale, all rising out of an ancient sea of olive oil, olives being the petroleum of this part of Africa in Roman times. But it's not the Colosseum that I remember most vividly about our gem. It's what happened in a slightly down at heel cafe opposite, where I sat eating a cheese sandwich while gazing back at the arcaded wonder just across from me. There are, by the way, a lot of cafes in this book. Cafes are, for me, the quintessence of travel. They're where you're, you put yourself together again after flying apart in a new city. That's why I feel little or no desire to go to Antarctica, however wondrous it might be. There are no cafes. Well, I was the only customer. The young waiter was sitting on a table under the awning with a friend, idly swinging his legs and trying from time to time to catch my attention. Sava, he called. Well, that could mean anything. Oui, merci, ça va. I took a sip of tepid coffee. Tu es seul? Here we go, I thought. Where is your wife? Where is your friend? Why are you alone? Would you like me to be your friend? Oui, tout seul. Then he surprised me. Tu es content? Content? Content. Heureux. He wanted to know if I was happy. <laughs> Do you mean at this moment or in life in general? I asked. He and his friend both smiled. I mean, are you a happy man? Yes, very happy, I said. I... Are you? Yes, I'm very happy too. All you need to be happy is work, girls, and a glass of beer. Don't you agree? <laughs> Legs still swinging, boyish grin. Now, this was a moment well worth coming to El Gem for. <laughs> I felt a tiny detonation of warm pleasure deep inside. But how should I answer? Jusqu'à un certain point. I said, and up to a point, I did agree. It's the ancient ideal of the simple but satisfying life. It's the life Virgil's shepherd lads dreamt of. It's more or less what Goethe believed peasant boys thought of as the good life. Good bread, good beer, and good soup. In other words, work followed by the nourishment and pleasure that being with someone you love assures you of. Needless to say, it's not nearly enough. Not for Virgil or Goethe or even for me. What makes me happy, but how could I have explained this to the waiter, is being interrupted while eating a sandwich in front of one of the Roman Empire's great architectural triumphs by the waiter telling me what he thinks happiness is. It cuts straight to my quick because it was both big and little at the same time. Do you know what I mean? Or as Gilles deftly put it when writing about Goethe, it was banality of a superior kind. I was elated. I set off for the museum across town with a new spring in my step. Well, occasionally one has an epiphany of a more radical kind. As a Protestant like Gide, with a lapsed Catholic father and Presbyterian mother, in my case, I'm aware of how different the Protestant and Catholic mentalities are. Although, perhaps nowadays, particularly here around Glenferry Road, everyone is simply postmodern. <laughs> but at some level, I think it's important to understand the Protestant mentality. It's very little written about. 
It's just taken for granted, and it's less dramatic than some others we can think of. And in the Cathedral of Porto in Portugal, of all places, I had a little epiphany that made me fully aware, for the first time, of what being Protestant means to me. <laughs> 